Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Each of you this morning, glad you could make it to this virtual meeting. As you know, we have our educational session first. And but before we get into that, we want to do a little housekeeping uh, overview. So Paul is going to direct us in that. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If we could just make sure that uh, if you're not speaking, if you could go ahead and mute, uh, and that will actually uh, reduce the, the audio interference when someone is speaking. And if you have any issues at all, you can actually just chat with me. I'll, I'll keep an eye out for the chat box if you wanted to send me messages. Uh, and I am going to call some names because I do have uh, some call in users that I'd, I'd like to know their names. So if you did call in, can you just let me know your name, please? Gail Colson. Thank you. Uh, Carla Hesselheim. Thank you. And just want to check here. I think there's yeah, three call-ins. I don't know who the third one is. Yeah, there's one that says owner on there. Um, can you check to see it says owner? Can you uh, identify yourself, please? That looks like Ms. Lewis. Hi, this is Yvonne Lewis. I'm trying to figure out how to set that, to put my name. Oh, oh no, that's fine. I'll, I'll change it for you, Ms. Lewis. And then there was one that said four over here. But yeah. that's it. Everyone else has their, has their names on there. So how many names do you have? Uh, we have 17 total on the WebEx. Yes. What of members? Oh, members? And one, two. So why don't we just mm -hmm. go through it? We have Ms. Cox. Yes. I saw Ms. Trask. I saw Ms. Lewis. How about Ms. Bridges? Ms. Lori, there. She's here. She's here. Okay, we can't see her. Yeah, I'm yeah. here. <laughs> Oh, um, Miss Yurovsky. Yes. I saw her. There's one. Hi, Owen. Miss <laughs> um, Osfall. Miss Osfall is on here. Yes. Okay. Mr. Walker, I think I'm we'll here. Today. Yep, he won't be here. We uh, know about uh, Carly Gale and Miss Pointer. We saw the. Uh, looks like we have everyone except for Mr. Walker. Okay. And actually, uh, Miss. Ms. Carolyn Cox isn't on there either. Okay. We're missing two. All right. So now we're going to go on. Thank you so much. We're going to move into the training session with um, Ms. Maria Kurtz. Remember, she's going to go over the kind of give us a financial report training. Thank you. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Um, Paul, are you presenting the presentation? Yes, I'm, I'm just pulling, following up. I'm pulling it up right now. Okay. So we give Paul a minute, uh, but you should all be able to see. Oh, here we go. Uh, today we're going to be uh, discussing what do we usually report in our monthly meetings and overall in the performance contract. What does it, it encompasses? It it encompasses when we're saying we received X amount of dollars in revenues and we spent X amount of dollars in internal services, for example. So the, the um, page three, please. So when you get to this page, this is familiar to everybody. This is the monthly financial report that we present and we go over collections and expenditures and other things that we have to record and capture uh, as adjustments perhaps in our financial status because we cannot utilize those funds for other purposes. So as we get into it, uh, we're going to go over the CSB revenue sources. And that is speaking to what we actually receive. So a major component of our receipts uh, is fees for services. And that includes 
Medicaid, other insurance, which can include Optima, Blue Cross, Anthem, Virginia Premier, uh, or anything else that a client may have as a personal insurance. Uh, it includes and it captures monthly services to other boards. So if we support Western Tidewater or Norfolk CSB uh, with the service, uh, then we will bill. And usually pathways may be an area where we will do that. Children's Services Act, um, that is capturing funds that we receive from CSA uh, for placing children and providing services to them that will be in Jim's area. School prevention contract, uh, that is handled by our prevention unit and we have an agreement with the school board to provide prevention services in a classroom setting uh, to teachers and parents. And so uh, quarterly we will be able for that service. Probation and parole is another area where we uh, bill for a service and um, that can happen through AOS primarily. Uh, self pays that is the cost share that a client may have uh, for the service that they receive. And that's what fees for services includes. As we continue, we capture state revenues. Uh, state revenues can come from a variety of sources and it can be straight from DBHDS or it can be through regional fiscal agents uh, that they distribute the dollars uh, to us either on a monthly or a quarterly basis. So state revenue, like I said, we have DBHDS direct and we have state other, which includes Department of Aging and Rehabilitative Services, DARS, uh, which uh, we uh, receive that revenue for placing clients in employment services under developmental services. Uh, we also receive state other funding for competency restoration that does not usually come through the uh, level of effort that we receive from the state directly for the performance contract. We receive state funding that we account for jail services initiative for the sheriff's uh, program and that does not come directly from DBHDS. We receive, like I said, state regional revenues and our main contributors for that will be Hampton Newport News, uh, which they provide us funding for crisis services, emergency services, community expansion. And we received funding from Western Tidewater, which will be primarily DAP. Once in a while, we may receive some additional funding uh, if uh, we're working on a new initiative. And we received uh, recently, we started receiving uh, some uh, funding from Chesapeake CS, uh, CSB uh, for clinical supervision in Jim's area. So with every good thing, we receive money and then we also have to give money out. So when we visit our expenditure categories, we're looking at the compo at various components. Uh, the primary component that we have is personnel. Uh, that includes all our full and part-time employees, city employees, includes overtime, includes contracted labor and benefits. Uh, your VRS, for example, your life insurance, health insurance, and uh, uh, FICA and FICA Medicaid. The next component is professional services. This is a bigger area, if you will, uh, with a variety of things that we may pay for. Uh, we pay for waste and refusal uh, services. Uh, that is um, our recycle, if you will, our paper, um, paper that we uh, use for different things. And then when we have finished, we uh, dispose in a container that it's recycled. Uh, so we have a monthly service there. Uh, security and safety and emergency services. That will be our security guards in our buildings. That will be our uh, fire prevention alarm system. And those kind of things will require continuous maintenance in order for the building to be safe. Uh, advertising and marketing and recruitment and retention. Uh, this will be uh, 
in um, in the admin world, if we were to recruit and advertise a position to be filled, uh, that will be captured there. But in the program, in the program environment, that can include advertisement for prevention services. Um, we uh, allocated costs there when we advertise for the OPTAR program or for uh, the state opioid response program that require uh, <clears throat> funds to be used to advertise uh, services. Event, entertainment, and recreational services. Uh, that can capture uh, primarily things that we do for clients. So if in an ICF environment, we were taking the clients to Bruce Gardens for the day as a day support activity. Uh, the cost of the tickets will be recognized there. Records management, that is HR. Um, I'm sorry, records management uh, includes um, cost uh, for uh, doing um, um, Excuse me, the more it looks me. Um, when we ask, when we have a new hire and we ask uh, to do the uh, background checks, um, that can go into records management. Uh, that's the cost we usually recognize there. It includes IT professional technology and software maintenance services. Um, that is all tied to new service, not uh, the recurring annual cost that we may have as part of our uh, IT infrastructure. Uh, external and training services, that is when we will bring somebody external to provide service to uh, training services to a big group of folks in the, in the department. Financial and management services. So in this bucket, we may capture um, a, uh, the cost settlement that we have for the ICFs, uh, which means that we can pay for the accountant, the external accountant that will review our um, preparation and um, complete the last steps for the cost settlement before it's ready to be submitted to the state. Uh, it would also include uh, when we uh, have a client and we have actually a lot of clients that are, um, we have the app center provide financial services to them. Uh, so the monthly cost for the app center will be recognized there. Uh, we also, uh, if we were to pay back in the ICF world uh, an amount uh, during the a cost settlement or in uh, the broader spectrum of things within the department if there was an audit and we had to pay back an amount this is the area that we will capture it professional health services this is the bucket that captures all the expenditures for the various professionals that we uh, contract and work with to provide services to our clients uh, it may be if we're sending clients uh, to the dentist and they require extensive work that might be there. If we have a, a professional come in and provide OTPT or speech therapy to our clients, that's a cost that will be realized under professional health services. Court services is an area that we usually don't have traffic, but it is uh, mostly, uh, it contains most costs that we will have to pay uh, for court services in connection with our clients. So if a case management, for example, um, had a client that needed to go to court for uh, competency or to assign um, a, a guardian, uh, there might be some small course, uh, court cost fees that we will capture there. Janitorial and landscaping services are is the uh, groundskeeping maintenance that we uh, have every month in some of our locations that are not city maintained. The same repair and ma uh, janitorial um, also includes in the janitorial the cleaning of facilities uh, daily or in some kind of random uh, 
uh, in a repeated fashion throughout the week in various facilities that we have clients and staff. <clears throat> Repair and maintenance services, we capture costs that are strictly uh, for repairing our facilities. It could be your light bulbs, it could be replacing uh, a broken water pipe, it could be uh, building uh, a new wall to separate an area into two different offices if we had to. Housing and rental assistance, um, that's an area where we capture primarily all client related costs. This will be if we're placing a client in a hotel as a short term solution because they're homeless and we're trying to find them suitable housing. That's that's where we will recognize that cost um, in the um, PSH, the permanent supportive housing program. That is where we recognize all expenditures with monthly rental fees um, and also utilities. Language and interpretation services. We often have a need to bring in somebody um, to provide uh, interpretation um, or, or sign language, and that's where we capture those costs. Transportation, moving and storage services. Uh, that, will, uh, that bucket may capture a little bit of um, our cost as well as client costs. So if we have a client that is transitioning from one housing to another, but they may have to go into temporary housing in, in the interim to until a suitable location may be identified and we have to store some of their belongings, we may pay the storage for a month or two until uh, they are officially transitioning to a new residence. Uh, we're also capture costs for us. We have a storage where we uh, maintain supplies for the SCFs in the form of big equipment that we do not repeatedly use. And so uh, when the uh, residents may have run out of storage capacity, we may have the need to uh, lease a storage unit for a period of time to house those items. Day support and in-home services. That area captures costs strictly for clients. Uh, that will be costs that we pay for them to attend summer camp, for example, or if they, um, if we pay, send them to um, uh, special persons mailing uh, for the day, we may have to, uh, we pay a cost for them to attend. Moving on to internal services, uh, that's another major area where we capture costs. Uh, internal services is everything that the city may pass a cost share to us. That would be risk management, which includes um, any liabilities we have. If, if we have one of our vehicles uh, involved in an accident and there may be a settlement that happens, uh, that's a liability that we'll recognize under risk management. Um, if we had an issue in a facility again, that might be under litigation. That may be recognized there as well. And also it captures costs for um, when we have uh, a staff member that it is um, out on disability due to um, uh, an event in the facility. City vehicle fleet services, that's uh, uh, the city maintains our vehicles. Uh, we're also fueled uh, through the city, those vehicles. Uh, we may have motor pool charges. We may borrow a vehicle from the city garage uh, if we need to, to do a, a special drag trip or something. So those costs are either passed uh, as an allocation at the beginning of the year or as we go throughout the months, we recognize a portion and that will be like your fuel charges or if we rent a vehicle. Telecommunications, yeah. those for uh, wide area network and local area network infrastructure services, uh, those are our maintenance fees, our, our um, existing and new subscriptions that we uh, recognize over a 12 month period. 
The next major area is other charges. Um, other charges contains a variety of things uh, from utilities um, to cell phones, postal fees. If we're mailing something out to clients, we pay through the postage here. Uh, dues and association member fees, we're part of uh, uh, VACSB, for example, and an annual membership will be paid through here. Uh, lease and rent of equipment that includes all our um, printers and scanners. Um, professional development, that is where we recognize um, the cost when we send somebody to training. Um, a renewal of licensing, if you will, that would also be captured here. Uh, travel. That travel includes um, two components, our business operations travel. Uh, that is our daily travel if we're going from one facility to another and we're using our personal vehicle. That is, that captures the cost of our clinicians driving out to see our customers uh, on a daily basis, especially if they're using their, their own personal vehicle. And then it includes uh, client services, field trips, and travel. If we have a client that we have to pay, for example, the bus fare to send them to treatment daily, because we have recognized that paying for their transportation to their service appointment is key element to uh, continuation of services and them. Uh, it's an elimination of barrier, if you will, especially if they don't have transportation. Uh, that cost will be recognized here. HS general relief. That is an area where we capture miscellaneous supports to our clients that does not fit into this to any other specific areas. So if we have somebody that um, it is down on their luck, for example, and they need that one time support to um, to pay their utility um, and they're not per se subscribed to uh, or receiving services from a, a, a housing program. Um, let's just say they receive case management services and on occasion they may have uh, a turn down and they need support with that utility. Uh, we will support them by by paying for the utility in that period. Um, if they need uh, um, and I'm blocking here usually, um, but usually it just covers those kind of supports that do not fit anywhere else and they are um, one time or maybe recurring supports if it is deemed that they could need to continue that support. Purchase client services, um, that is an area where we don't use quite often, um, but we, uh, I will have to look at this if you want further explanation. Nothing comes to mind right now that we will pay out of that specific area. Um, daycare, sometimes we have uh, clients that require that support. Um, it's a key element to their service, and that's why we will cover that cost. Uh, HS protective services, that's an area where um, we will pay for uh, clients uh, into our adult uh, protective services program. Um, we don't in the CSB use it quite often. Uh, very randomly do we have a need for it. The next major component is supplies. Uh, here we recognize office supplies, household supplies, food and food service supplies, uh, some repair and maintenance. Uh, sometimes we have light bulbs, for example, or batteries for the uh, smoke alarms that we may pay for here. Technology and software supplies, if we are purchasing monitors for a computer or if we're replacing a keyboard and a mouse, uh, that will come through here. Books and publications, uh, this bucket can cover uh, books and publications for, for our use as we 
provide it to our staff for educational purposes or for extending that knowledge. And also for our clients, uh, we purchase a lot of uh, publication items uh, that we hand out to our clients uh, for their education and their continuation in, in treatment. Um, instructional supplies, uh, that's again another area where uh, we can purchase supplies primarily for clients and, and for use in preparing materials for clients to receive either when they are attending group therapy or, uh, or uh, through Project Link, for example, as a handout. Uniforms and protective apparel. Um, our our PATH program is an area that uses this bucket. They purchase um, uh, T-shirts to shirts to recognize them as uh, city employees uh, when they're out there in the community doing it, and they wear it out there when they are doing outreach. Uh, sometimes we have the need to. Um, Recently, we had the need to purchase uh, protective uniforms for staff that deal with clients and um, a way to um, protect themselves and the clients, if you will. And that's where that uh, cost was recognized. Um, medical. Medical supplies is everything that we purchase for the care of our clients. Uh, but also it will capture gloves, it will capture medications for the clients, it will capture um, uh, protective um, uh, thermometers, um, lifts, if you will, if we need to and lift the slings, uh, it will capture um, Um, cover medications. So, in essence, it captures all uh, medical supplies we may have to purchase for care and for client use. Leases and rental fees, um, that area captures our cost for our facilities that we rent uh, from external uh, entities and they're not city owned. Capital outlay, um, our use in that area may vary and fluctuate from year to year. Uh, sometimes we have technology equipment, which includes computer um, assets um, and um, capital projects where we may have facility build outs and it includes vehicles, three major areas. So at this time, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Hopefully everyone found that helpful. I know uh, during our uh, general meetings, the financial report is done and uh, there are a lot of different line items on that report. Um, I know previously some of the board members had asked to better understand uh, that report and hopefully this was helpful in accomplishing that. Thanks, Maria. Thank you, Maria. You're welcome. Are there any questions? If not, then we are ready to uh, adjourn the educational session and move into the formal session. So I'm now calling to order our formal session. You see the minutes, um, and I hope you had an opportunity to review those minutes. Did everyone have an opportunity to review them? And are we ready to uh, are we ready to receive them? So someone will need a motion to accept the minutes from our last meeting. Can I get a motion to accept the minutes for the last meeting? I make a motion that we re uh, receive them. And Bobby All right, Molly, and can I have a second? Molly has motioned that we accept the minutes for the last meeting. I need a second. Yvonne Lewis, I second. Yvonne Lewis, second motion. 
to be in the minutes of the last meeting. And our committee reports, um, again, we did not have our committee meetings due to the pandemic. However, um, we will be going over the, the behavioral staff will go over the waiting list and the incident report summary. And Tim's going to go over his slots, et cetera. So I believe you received those in, the, in, the, in your um, email as well. So we are ready and free to go over, to go over the, those reports. Um, which one? Uh, Let's do the person serving the waiting list for a Okay, let's start there. Okay, um, so Paul has pulled up the person served and waiting list report. Um, as you know, this report reviews our uh, number served and the numbers waiting for services. This report looks at July and June, uh, the previous month. Um, and looking at this, you'll notice that our numbers served increased slightly, um, and our numbers waiting also increased slightly in terms of the overall uh, performance of the um, division. Some areas that I would like to um, highlight include um, mental health services at our Pembroke 6 outpatient program. That um, saw a, uh, an increase. And that's due to uh, same day access folks coming in. And it's also partly due to day treatment being closed. So some of the clients that would have transitioned over to day treatment are receiving those services in outpatient at P6. Um, you also notice that we have um, some folks waiting for P6. That's a little bit different. Um, the reason for that is that individuals are waiting for psychiatric evaluations. The wait time is about two weeks now, I'm told. Um, but uh, please be assured that we are still doing the screenings for medication. So if someone comes to us and they do not have a supply of medications, they will be screened by a prescriber so that they can get the medication filled until uh, a psychiatric eval appointment comes up. Uh, we did see in case management an increase in the number served, and we also saw an increase in the waiting list. You'll notice in June that we did not have any folks waiting. In July, that went up to 25 people on the waiting list, and the reason for that is we've had multiple vacancies. Um, we, all, we have had some exemptions, and we're hoping to recruit those soon. Do you say all vacancies on the staff? Great. Okay. Um, Aqua had a significant increase as well, and that's due to a training they had in July on anxiety disorders. And that's every, everybody else stayed approximately the same. Do you have any questions? Angela, this is Yvonne Lewis. Oh, I, I didn't notice that supported it. Good morning. How you doing? <laughs> I have questions. Um, I'm wondering how the COVID has impacted on your numbers and services. Does this reflect that? Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. I said I'm wondering oh, how the, the okay. pandemic, COVID-19, has impacted your numbers as far as services being able to provide and the number and the increases or decreases? Um, well, we have seen that we saw when, when the pandemic first started, we saw a decrease. And then it came back up again and we're, we're plateauing back to where we used to be. Um, the, the biggest impact that we've had is in our day programs. As you know, Skill Quest, uh, mm -hmm. Beach House and Adult Day Treatment are all closed. Mm -hmm. So that has had the largest impact. So are you having are, are, you tele -treatment? are you doing teletreatment with some of those patients, clients? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And in fact, um, the, the individuals that were served by the day treatment uh, day treatment program and the other 
uh, psychosocial rehab and skill quests, those folks are being served by um, clinicians in other areas. Oh, okay. Uh, with Beach House in particular, we maintained a small group of staff, of Beach House staff, and they reach out to those clients um, two to three times a week. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions on the waiting list? Um, I had a question um, with regards to Beach House. I was talking to one of the clients and um, he said, so are we not providing any transportation if someone needs to get to Beach House to receive their medication? If someone needs to receive their medication, they would be getting that through our outpatient clinic. Um, and if they need help with transportation, we're working that out on a case by case basis. Okay, um, so so the person would actually need to request it. Yes, uh, we have options to help. We have bus passes. Uh, we uh, will pay for cabs for people. Uh, we are trying our best not to transport uh, because it's close quarters in a vehicle, and so the protection for the protection of the client. And our staff, we're trying to avoid that when we can. Uh, but there are times when we have transported because it was absolutely critical to do so. Um, and we take precautions um, while in the vehicle. Um, okay. but, uh, but if someone needs medication, they just need to talk to their provider, whoever that is, if it's their therapist or prescriber, case manager, and let them know what the needs are. Uh, we're also taking medications out to people. So if the person can't come to us, we'll take the medication to them. And that's a very safe way of making sure that people have their medications. So if, if you hear of someone that um, is concerned about being able to get their medications, make sure um, to tell them to contact their provider, and we will make it happen. Okay, thank you. Okay, and I had a question about supportive residential services. Mm -hmm. I see that that was a decrease. Yes, you have an eye for detail, Dr. Harvey. Um, and I had forgotten to mention that. There's a decrease in uh, the supportive residential numbers because the supervisor last year had included Beach Park East and West in that line item, and she felt it was a duplication of the second uh, skill building line items, so she separated those out. Okay. So you'll see those 36 people reflected in skill building, but you no longer see them duplicated in SRS. Okay. So it was, it's not really a reflection of the number served as it is uh, a change in the report structure. Okay. So how are they providing services or, or we? providing services to those um, students, those clients in your skill building program team? Uh, very carefully. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, they are still providing those services. They are doing some telehealth and, and, and phone services, but they also go in the home when they need to. Um, we are trying to reduce the amount of time that they spend there. And when they go in, they're, they're wearing their mask and they're asking the client to wear a mask. Um, and so they have a PPE in place. Um, but uh, what we're trying to do is minimize the in-home services to the extent we can. So they're going for walks with people, meeting outside where they can maintain privacy. Um, so our staff are, are getting very creative in how to continue services in a way that is safe. that answer the, the question or would you like more information? Or it looks more right for now. Okay. Okay. Now, the, the, I guess the message is none of our services have really stopped except for the day program. And even for those clients, they're being served in other ways. We made sure that they had other ways of connecting with our staff and that we're reaching out to them. Um, but our services have been maintained. They're just being done in a different way, in a, in a modified way. 
Okay, is that good? Hello? It's hard not to well, see. Yeah, uh, as long as we're not getting a lot of getting a lot of uh, complaints and all from, you know, guardians or okay, the numbers okay, they have with their services. Not not on the behavioral health side. I'll let Tim speak to whether or not he's experienced that on the developmental services side. Okay. Thank you. Tim, do you want to comment on that? Okay. Okay, we'll wait for that. Okay, I'll, I'll bring it up when my turn comes. Okay. All right, uh, we'll move on to the incident management report. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I actually had a question. This is Catrice Washington. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, are there any, um, uh, is there anything in place for staff to be tested? Like, is there any, uh, Anything set up like that to, you know, uh, you know, we're taking precautions to protect the clients, but what about the staff? Like, are they being tested or has anyone discussed that? There's actually been a lot of this discussion around that um, at, the, at a citywide level around that. Um, when we have a, an exposure come up and there's risk to the staff, we have conversations with the health department, with our occupational health department. Um, and they provide information to the staff. Um, the role is really with our occupational health and the public health department. And so they provide information about the different testing sites. Um, that has happened a few times. And uh, when that has happened, uh, they're given um, uh, not just the testing sites, but sometimes there are testing events um, where staff can go and get in faster. Um, so they get that information. Uh, there was one particular situation where the health department was absolutely wonderful and they hosted a testing event at their building in the parking lot. So That's our good. staff were able to drive through and get those tests without waiting. Um, That's so good. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. You're All right, and I see Paul has the incident uh, management report pulled up. In July, we did have one founded um, case of neglect in that situation. It was a medication error, error um, by one of our prescribers. Uh, they had um, written an order incorrectly. Um, there was no harm to the client. Um, it was an altered dosage. Um, so fortunately, there, there was no harm there and they did uh, it was the pathways and they did a training for prescribers reminding them of some of the standards around writing orders. Um, you will also see under med, er med errors that we had one in July, that is the same event. Under complaints, um, I did notice an error in your report. Uh, didn't have enough time to um, correct it, uh, but you'll see under grand total for complaints, says one, it should be two. Uh, we had one um, violation and one uh, no violation was founded. Um, this was, uh, the violation was related to confidentiality uh, for a client. One of um, our staff accidentally shared um, some private information with uh, someone else other than the, the client. Uh, they were able to pull that back quickly, so no harm done. However, it was just a violation that occurred. Uh, luckily, that is uh, very rare for us, um, but we still did training for the entire program where it occurred. But there were no penalty, no, no penalty, uh, no, personal penalized. No, no. no. Luckily, we, we uh, realized it very quickly. And so we were able to get the information back um, within hours. Um, for the no violation, um, that complaint was not founded and that was related to an individual not being pleased with their housing option. Uh, so we did everything that we could um, to try to provide a housing option that the person would be pleased with, um, but that they, they still um, we're not happy with it. We continue to work with them on that, but it was unfounded um, in terms of a violation. 
because this is one of the violations of breach of confidentiality. The client complained, yes. And was that client satisfied with the actions taken? Yes. Yes. We got back with the client, we explained what had happened and what the resolution was. And uh, she was okay with it after she realized that we got the information back with her. Under serious injury, uh, we had uh, 15 total in June, 19 total in July. And as usual, I just try to give you an overview of some of the different types of injuries and illnesses that we um, observed during those months. Um, it ranged from arm pain to uh, breathing difficulties. We did have multiple COVID cases, all of those get reported. Uh, we had chest pain, um, a uh, cardiac arrest, disorientation, overdoses, uh, and those are the, the biggest categories of what we were seeing. Um, so a lot of medical, medical illnesses. Um, under deaths, in June we had five, one accidental and one uh, natural or unknown cause. In July, we had three, um, all of those being natural or unknown. The um, one accidental in June was an overdose. Um, and the, the, uh, the other seven throughout June and July um, were individuals with serious medical issues. Um, two of those were actually in hospice care at the time that they passed. One had to do with a liver transplant plant failure. Um, we had an unknown cause where we just never found out um, exactly what the, the cause of death was. And we did have three uh, overdoses, but they were not confirmed, they were suspected. Um, and then of course we do not use emergency restraint in behavioral health. Um, in the suicide attempt category, we had two in June and four in July. I reviewed all of those reports and those individuals were either hospitalized or they had a safety plan uh, where they had wraparound services to stabilize them in the community with a less restrictive option. And sometimes that involves getting them in faster to see their psychiatrist um, or doing other wraparound changes in their service. Um, but all of those were uh, treated very seriously as you can. Any questions about the incident management report? I have a question. I'll this is Catrice, Catrice Washington. Um, for the overdose for the accidental, is this from the individual doing it themselves with the medication? Yes. Okay. Yes. It could be medication, um, or it could be um, drug use, Got it. recreational drug use, where um, they took more than they intended to, and it had an adverse outcome. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Tim. We're ready for you. Hi, Tim. Hey, how are you? Morning. All right. That's another Paul surprised me which one he wanted to pick up. So uh looks like we got the incident management <laughs> first. Um, so I will start from the top with our abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Um, you see we had two each month. Uh, two were, you know, I break them down for you. I had two in the group home and two in our ICF. Um, they... Uh, the uh, group home one was the same incident. I had a client on client issue that that, that was the founded one as well. Um, you know, where I had a, one client aggression on, on another client and um, the uh, ICF ones were medication errors. So if, and moving on to medication errors, uh, you see we had six for the two months. Um, none, none of them were founded. Uh, we had four in the ICF and two in our in-home uh, program. Uh, our partner program. Moving down to complaints, um, 
had three in, in this time span, which is kind of a lot, kind of a lot for us. Uh, two were in the group home, uh, and they were the same incident, actually. I like to talk about that a little bit. This is actually a good thing of check and balances uh, that we have almost on ourselves as we had a uh, staff member working in the group home who uh, was new to the group home and uh, had worked in our uh, supportive living program and thought that uh, we, the staff, weren't allowing one of the clients to get back into their room. Um, and we had a treatment plan for them. She actually kind of, you know, reported it to her supervisor. We kind of reported ourselves to CQI for it. And, uh, uh, but you know, that was, uh, you know, so that's good that we actually check upon ourselves. Uh, the, the third one was in the ICF. Uh, we had a parent complaints of uh, this is our, our health issue where we, the nurse was um, the nurse at the ICF was on the phone with the doctor and the parent and the communication was a little bit off and the parent uh, felt that, that we weren't doing a good enough job uh, on, the, on the backside of the phone. So. Uh, we were able to talk to the nurse about being prepared and how to do video a little bit better. So a little bit of a learning curve. Um, serious injury, um, uh, 22 total. Uh, if you look in June and then my July number is high, I'm going to break this out for you real quick because something's a little bit different here. Uh, in home, we had two ICF for four. You know, as you know, the serious injury could be uh, any unplanned medical event, uh, you know, if we had to go to the doctor's office for something, and we did have a few people in the ICF go out. But of interest, we had 16 of these are in our case management division, which usually has zero or one or two. Um, and I heard the question earlier about uh, some of the stuff that, that the COVID has uh, impacted. Um, we had 13 cases in case management of people who uh, were diagnosed uh, uh, were tested in the positive. But what that stemmed from, these are consumers that we serve in case management that live either in private home, uh, group homes. We had day programs open up at the very beginning of July, waiver day programs similar to our skill quest. And in about two to three of them, they had an outbreak. And so these individuals are at the day program and they all go to separate uh, group homes and they were infected in those people. So we were pinging all over the place. And I talked to my peers in, you know, Chesapeake and Norfolk and Portsmouth, and they are, you know, same group homes, got people living there. So we had this very large uh, influx in a very short period of time of uh, people testing positive uh, for that. No impact on our staff with, you know, because we're still doing some telehealth, we're, you know, doing video uh, with them, but, uh, you know, we did have to track all this. and. Uh, Everybody has recovered and the day programs, those particular day programs closed and have not reopened. So um, I don't want to say anything, but we haven't had a, a new one here in a couple of weeks, a new case in a couple of weeks. Deaths, there's five in the past two months. Uh, four were in case management where we serve folks in the community. We had someone uh, um, had lung cancer. We had an individual with a G2 um, issue and uh, 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 a woman uh, with G2 that had some aspiration type issues. Uh, we have one in a nursing home and um, one who was uh, a natural cause of old, uh, being old. Um, and the final one, we did have a death in our ICF, which is unfortunate. He had been in the hospital for a while, uh, non COVID related uh, failure. He, uh, he did pass away uh, last month. So that was a death in our ICF. Um, no restraint issues and no suicide uh, attempts in DS past two months. Any questions with that? Right. While uh, while he's switching over um, the, the documents, uh, what Tim was saying about how our our clients who were attending some of those private day programs, they were. Um, exposed and we, um, you know, they were, there was an outbreak in some of those places. I think it illustrates how important it is that we're being very cautious because we have very large day programs and, um, you know, it could be uh, a really bad scenario if we had all those people in a congregate setting um, and someone came in with a positive case. Um, so I think it just illustrates the importance of our cautious approach. So, so Angela, this is Yvonne again. Are you getting enough supplies, PPE supplies? We are now. We are now. It was rough going in the beginning for the whole country, really. Uh, 
Um, but uh, we are now. Okay. Okay, are we ready for this one? Yeah. All right, this is our um, our, wait our uh, waiver uh, service and uh, wait list report, called the slot report, um, looking at June and July months, uh, which remember the, the waiver is broken down into three different types of waivers. So we have it broken down to you and how many of these are the active slots. Uh, so we have uh, 614 in our community living. This is the one that includes congregate, if you remember, which we consider the old wing one. Um, we did, I think we had, um, a waiver, uh, waste hack meeting in May, I think was our last one. So we, we had one increase in our, in our waiver slot there. So you won't see a lot of increases, a lot of movement, uh, this, this, uh, time. Um, our fifths, our family individual supports, we're at 183 and our building independence. We are at 20 for a total of 817 active waiver slots, uh, that we're, we are serving. Um, if you go down a little bit farther, we've got the uh, wait lists. Um, we have different priorities now. If you remember, we used to have urgent, non-urgent. Um, so our priority one is at 43. If you remember, I was pretty excited. We got that down really low for a hot second, uh, which was nice. Because that's that's where we have to serve. That we have to serve the priority ones first. Um, so, but we're up to 43. And that's usually the mad dash around July to make sure we get everybody up there as we can because we get our new waiver slots. I don't know about that real quick at the end of this, but um, so our priority two of 147 and our priority, which is usually like the school kids and such is at 174. So um, still have a large waiting list and I, I don't know if we're ever going to see that dwindle, but uh, we did get our announcement of our new slots uh, last week. And uh, we each got 33 new waiver slots, which is always exciting. Nice, nice number. But as you recall, we the, the community living slot number is dwindling. So out of those 33, only five are community living. So those are the ones that include the congregate care, the group homes. So the uh, family, the, the fifth slots are 28. So those are the ones that you get residential, but it's supported living type residential and apartment stuff. They all include day program. So uh, we're pretty excited about that. Um, the state's not gonna do our, um, our waiver committee meeting for these new slots probably September because we have a couple of attrition slots. We have a meeting set up at the end of this month and they didn't want to combine. So uh, we'll be we'll be giving out these 33 probably in September. Kim, yes. What is hold? What is hold? Going back to the first mm -hmm. page. What is the community living? It says hold six. What is what is hold? Oh, a hold. Oh, sorry. A hold slot is um, if someone could be out of service. We're allowed to hold the slot. So if, if um, we'll hold them if they're in Eastern State, for example, we can't bill, but uh, we don't want to give up that waiver slot. So we have to do a form and fill it out uh, and tell the state why we're holding that slot for that individual. If um, someone, if someone don't say they only receive a day program and they break their leg and they're out for two months, we'll have to hold that slot. The state is not requiring us to do hold slots for uh, people whose day program is closed right now, and that's the only service they receive. You could be out of day program, but in residential, you don't have to do a hold slot. A hold slot's when you're completely out of any waiver service. It's case management's not a waiver service. So once you're out of a service, we have to hold the slot. Um, and, and the state will start evaluating that. If we hold them for too long, they'll say, hey, why are you holding this? You gotta give it back up. And I'm kind of a stickler for that, because yeah, as you see, I got a large waiting list. I wanna make sure that People aren't uh, taking too long to, you know, hold their slot. And we, a lot of these folks, they'll get the waiver, and they, then the family will uh, drag their feet in trying to get to a service, and they're supposed to take it within 30 days. So I'll only for three months, and then I'll I'll take the slot back. I'm like, hey, you know, you've been picking us to get the slot. Um, you know, I got people who are waiting, but if I've got someone who has a lot of. Uh, uh, maybe some psychiatric issues, these dual diagnosed folks who uh, really need that waiver to, to survive in the community, but they, they are in Eastern state for a couple months, we'll hold it because we know that person's gonna need it on the way out. So that's what those, that's what those hold slots are. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Tim? Okay, so not, thank you, Tim. Well, okay, I think we got the, the, we have one more. 
I think it was the uh, census numbers. Yeah, is, yeah, that, yeah. So this is the one that I didn't have last month, if you recall. So, um, and as I started playing with it a little bit this month, I, I, I'm gonna make some changes on this as we go along. And one of the changes, right, is our enrollment, but not the actual people we're serving. And I, I couldn't get it done in time, but like for CEO, uh, we've got 232 people enrolled for jobs, but as you remember, we were down to almost 30 that were staying working. We're up to about 90 uh, people. That can, I think we, I'm going to start tracking this a little bit better for you because I, I heard the question before, how is COVID affected? Right now, even if you look in SkillQuest, I've got the number enrolled, even though that number being served is zero, you know, because these folks are still enrolled in our programs, but I think, you know, it'd be more relevant for you all to see how they were serving. <laughs> so I'm going to break that out a little bit different. Uh, but yeah, be the beginning of this year. I didn't have the number last year, last month. So these are the current numbers that we are uh, that we served in July. So let me understand. You're saying the numbers show enrollment, but not service. Correct. The SkillQuest is a perfect example. They're still enrolled, you know, in our in our services. We're not billing well we are actually billing for them the state let us bill up to july uh, a, a small fee for them but uh, you know we're not attending skill quest so i think this is you know being with COVID, it's it's a little misleading of my numbers of actually served so i think given what we're in and fix that a little bit for you next month so i'm concerned yeah and, and ceo is another good example where right now we you know we're not 232 people aren't working in the community every day. We've got about 90 to 95. Those numbers are steadily going up, which is nice. A lot of these employers are bringing our folks back, which is pretty encouraging. Okay. Your case management, infant, the group homes, those numbers are accurate. Okay. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to and, and I just have one little more comment while I got the mic is that today is our infant graduation virtual. Well, actually, the drive through so It's not so much virtual. We're doing a drive through here. I'm actually at the uh, the main building today. Um, and uh, it's already set up where Pete the Cat's going to be there. And uh, we got some tents outside. Eileen is right down the hall from me, feverishly emailing me that it's raining, like, because I have a window as well. And it is pouring here. Pouring <laughs> there? But I see some sun coming, so it's gonna it's gonna work for us. I have faith. <laughs> Thank you. I have wild babies. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kim. We're ready now to go to the financial report. Our report today is uh, reflecting our year-end performance uh, with the actuals as of June 30th, 2020. Um, when we're looking at fees, per we're going to go over the revenues first. Fees for services, we ended up at 88% of our target budget for the year with $23.8 million collected. State revenue, uh, we realized 15783704 That amounts to 111% uh, against target. Federal revenue, we finished at 93% with 3.2 million over 3.5 million target. Um, in this area, we were a little bit less because um, uh, we had anticipated some additional funding for the SOAR program. Um, however, as uh, Medicaid is, uh, is starting to collect to pay, cover more of the services, uh, we utilize less dollars, so we did not have additional funding there this year. Miscellaneous revenue, uh, we have a high performance. We had a number of things that were um, happening here uh, our miscellaneous revenue comes in collections at uh, beach house program which we were training high to begin with all throughout the year uh, we also had uh, have the uh, skill quest art show uh, collections there and we had uh, a refund 
uh, from um, EVMS. Uh, we go through the course of the year. We're on a contract with them, and uh, occasionally they refund us uh, some of the money uh, because we pay a flat rate uh, quarterly for their services. So an evaluation happens, then they refund us. Um, for fund reserve, uh, we had a 21% performance. Uh, we here we have a budget of $331,000. However, at the end of the year, uh, we realize it to actual performance. We only utilize 70,000 of that retained funding uh, that we had projected to use for the year. General fund support at 14.5 million. That is uh, realized at 100%. So that gave us an overall performance of 96% uh, for revenue collection uh, in this year. For expenditures, uh, personnel, we were at 97% uh, with 45.2 million expended. Um, and that includes our full-time, part-time city employees, uh, contract, uh, contracted labor dollars as well. Professional services, uh, we expended six, six, a little over six million uh, with an overall performance at 82%. Internal services at 1.3 million, 96% performance overall. Other charges, we were at 92% uh, with $962,000 expended. Supplies at 1.2 million at 69%. Um, that is very close to our average trend year over year. Leases and rentals are 95% with 1.2 million expended and capital outlay at 183,000, which made 96% uh, 96, 96 of target. That gave us uh, about, when comparing our collections uh, and our expenditures, we came uh, with a, uh, a surplus of revenue of 1.2 million. However, as we uh, look at our financial and do the adjustments, we need to observe uh, for funding that it is tied to specific services and we cannot reallocate uh, to offset other expenditures. Uh, we had to reserve the funding for the service program at $564,000. Outpatient at 152, outpatient mad service 128 to 50. CIT conference, the state gave us $185,000 for the CIT conference that it was supposed to take place back in May. However, it, it is pushed back to October and it may be pushed back again. So we needed to retain those funds for future use. CIT law enforcement uh, funding from the state, we had to reserve at $178,000. Primary care, we had a balance of $83,776. Project uh, Lake PPW, we had to reserve $74,940 for future use. And pharmacy supports $44,000, a little over $44,000. Uh, then we took a look at our fees receivable. Um, this is what we still have outstanding in collections, and we're at 1.5, 2.5 million, I'm sorry. Um, and then we deducted uh, what we believe still to be as a pending um, expense that we did not receive uh, by the time the fiscal year closed. So that is valued at 1.2 million, which leave us with a surplus of 1.4 million. Okay. 1.4 million. Yeah. 1.14. I'm sorry, yes, I 1.4. 1.14. I'm sorry. I think it did it there. <laughs> I wish it was 1.4. Um, any questions? So, uh, I'm, I'm, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. 
Oh, no. I was just, this is Yvonne Lewis again. <laughs> As you know, next week, the, uh, the legislators are going back into session. And I know they're going to be making, I'm thinking, adjustments, you know, to revenue and I guess what they put out. What will, what kind of uh, damage do you think or project might, you know, impact us, our community service, your budget? I'm not sure I got the whole question because it kind of, would you mind repeating the last part? What kind of revenue? Uh, what, what, yeah, if, if they're, um, you know, they're going to be discussing the budget, the state's right. proposed, approved budget. And I'm looking, I'm thinking about the cuts, where they're yeah. looking at cutting your, your sure. revenue. Uh, that's a good question, Ms. Lewis, uh, that's weighing on all of our minds. Um, I saw some email traffic and documents floating um, that indicates a 15% cut potentially at the state uh, level. Um, so we don't know at this point how that will trickle down to the CSPs. Don't worry, I'll be watching. <laughs> we, we're watching it very closely too. Um, we have uh, calls every other week with uh, the BACSB and the uh, Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. Um, and thus far, uh, they haven't announced anything about cuts that will roll down to us, uh, but we're watching it closely uh, because we know if the, if the governor uh, does a 15% across the board, it will impact DBHDS, um, and then it, we will most likely see some of those cuts as well. But right now, we, we have not had any official work. Unless you got something. We never will get. We didn't get. We never got the full funding for Step Up, did we? No, ma'am. No. Um, that that uh, funding for the remaining steps of Step Virginia was placed on hold. Okay. Yeah. So if, if, if the situation, you know, there's a lot of uh, talk about, you know, if we're lucky. Maybe the situation will turn around and the state um, losses won't be as catastrophic as they're expecting. Um, and if so, they might be able to restore uh, some of that. But right now, uh, I, to be honest with you, I think the, the financial uh, forecast does, does not look favorable, at least this year. Um, there, um, there's still uh, some conversations around crisis services, as you know. Um, step one was same day access, which was implemented. Uh, step two was primary care screening, which was uh, implemented for the most part. Um, and then outpatient services. Uh, we also received some positions of funding for that. The next step was crisis services. Um, and there have been statewide uh, state work groups uh, looking at how we can redesign crisis services for adults and children. And Jen has been part of uh, work groups um, that occurred in the past around this. So um, the state is still looking to redesign our crisis services and that is in play right now. Uh, they just uh, are not gonna have the same pot of money uh, that they would have. Uh, so as soon as I get more information on what that is gonna look like, uh, Jim and I will bring it forward to you so that um, you have an awareness of, of the crisis part of Step Virginia. Uh, but right now, they're not even talking about the other the other step. Thank you, Angie. For that, we're moving on to the next one, unless you have a question on the first one. I was just commenting on how nice Miss Lewis's smile is. And so now I'll just tell everybody because she was right up on the screen and smiled so nice that it's actually what I comment on. <laughs> <clears throat> So um, on the next item uh, we have is the comparison of uh, fiscal year 20 versus fiscal year 19 performance by category. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So when we're looking at the prior year and how we ended up uh, this fiscal year, uh, we can see that the ups and downs and the, and how uh, our individual buckets of collections uh, are comparing to each other. Uh, so fee for, fees for services this year, we went down some. Um, that is due primarily uh, due to COVID-19. Uh, our last quarter, for almost three and a half months, actually, if you will, uh, so it declined and then it's picked up and, and we have two, three programs that are not doing business, therefore they have no collections there as well. Um, so that's the major uh, driver for that impact. State revenue, uh, we have some additional funds that we received this year, and um, that, was also, uh, that was the same day access funds for primary care and, and um, uh, same day access uh, that then outpatient that we received that uh, it was more than we received last year. That accounts for that. We had one time uh, $303,000 uh, set off uh, for Medicaid expansion. So those things account for that increase. Uh, federal revenues, again, uh, we discussed it a little bit earlier. We went down this time. We had about $300,000, which would have been uh, SOAR funding. Uh, however, uh, as Medicaid is picking up more of the services, our SOAR funding decreased a little bit and we only received $400,000 this year. And small, uh, one, small things happening to account for the rest of the revenue. Um, miscellaneous revenue, uh, we had a big refund from EVMS that accounted for that. Uh, for our revenue this year. However, it wasn't as big as it was the prior year before. Um, we received about $23,000 this year and we received about 46 last year. So that accounts for that difference. Fund reserves, again, we recognized as we spent it each year. Uh, so this year we did not have as many expenditures uh, to use that and um, that's what accounts for that difference. And general fund support, we had a, a higher contribution this year uh, than we did last year. Expenditures by uh, category, again, um, we had a higher labor utilization this year, but we also had additional positions uh, due to same day access, primary care, and outpatient uh, being tied to at least uh, major in majority to positions, uh, of, so that uh, that help us go over what we usually uh, expend. Professional services, we're just slightly over last year uh, in performance, uh, so that's that area is pretty much the same. Internal services. Um, we went down actually a little bit this year because some of our risk management um, liabilities uh, went away. Therefore, uh, that's where we had our major down. Uh, it was in risk management. Other charges, uh, we're at 9.6 versus 1 million, a little over 1 million last year. And um, that's again uh, an area where it's based on need. So as we need year over year, it may fluctuate a little bit. Um, supplies at 1.2 million versus 1.4 last year. Um, we had some changes there because uh, with staff not being in the office five days a week and uh, we're doing more remoting and stuff, we did not use some of the supplies that we or at least we didn't need some of the supplies that we will buy in the fourth quarter of the fiscal year. So um, some of the very some of the bigger variances are there. Um, Leases and rentals were fairly uh, the same uh, as we were last year. Last year we had um, a location that had a residual clause uh, cost when we closed. Um, uh, the Lindy Haven Center program, uh, we had a little bit of that cost of 
the, uh, that was allocated in the year, in the new year, but um, that um, that cost that went from the beach house though to support uh, the adult day treatment uh, program, uh, it was relatively the same, but just a little bit less. So that left us uh, with that lower costs here. And capital outlay, uh, we had vehicles and some computers that we purchased this year that we didn't have it last year. Next page. So this page is showing us the year over year comparison um, uh, side by side in different view and, and the increase or the decrease that we may experience through the individual line items uh, as the two years compare. So for overall revenues, uh, we, per, we were at 2% higher this year over last year. And for expenditures, again, we ended up about 2% higher. Any questions here? So, um, our fee for services for fiscal year, what we went through that, that was at 88%. So, that covers um, this part of the review. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Any questions? No questions? I, I do want to uh, point out the fact that we did uh, we did have a uh, loss in revenue or reduction rather um, in revenue uh, due to uh, different areas that weren't performing at 100% uh, when the pandemic came up, uh, about and then of course the closure of our day program services. Um, has caused um, a reduction in revenue as well. So um, just wanted to be transparent about that, put it out there and let you know that um, uh, our leadership team, Eileen and myself and um, Don and Maria, um, Tim and Jim and everybody, we're all looking at this very closely and we're monitoring it um, to see how it's going to play out in the future. And as we get updates, we'll be, be coming back to you on that um, but it is something that we are uh, following very closely. Any questions about Andy's statement, explanation? Oh. We will move on to the next item on the agenda. It is the, oh, the approval of the 2021 performance contract extension. And as you remember, we were given an extensive overview last month uh, about the, the contract extension. And I think the staff is going to give us a, a brief summary just to, just to um, refresh us, but not. Okay. Uh, and I'm sure Maria will chime in if I miss something, but. Um, if you recall, uh, the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services uh, gave us an extension of the previous contract through uh, December 31st. Um, so they gave us a six month extension for the majority of the contract, but there were some areas that changed. Um, and we highlighted those uh, for you in the, at the June meeting. One of the biggest uh, changes was Exhibit M. Um, and that was the area that Tim reviewed uh, where they have created new Department of Justice requirements, um, including three new assessment tools. Um, and we've been working with um, our IT department to develop those tools in the electronic health record. Um, so we made good progress with that. Um, but Exhibit M and the DOJ requirements were, uh, was really the biggest impact um, to us, including a change in the uh, in the budget. And so if you want to talk about that, I think it went to 64 million and something like that. I don't have that. So, 
So um, our overall budget for yeah. So when we developed our budget for the fiscal year, well, we re, while we were dealing with an extension for a six month period, we see us through December 31st, uh, our financial package, our exhibit A, talks to a 12 month performance uh, with a total cost of 64.9 million. Um, <clears throat> So when we're reviewing uh, what goes into the performance uh, and contract, uh, we took in all our revenues and all our expenditures. But uh, when we started with our revenues, our baseline, uh, we, had, we did after the infant program uh, because that's something that reports elsewhere and not in the performance contract. We added any transportation fees uh, that are tied to um, services to our clients and any CQI fees, again, that may be uh, part of our service delivery. Uh, and usually any fees that we see there are tied to records requested for our clients. Complex care retaining earnings of $250,000 were added uh, to um, the budget for the revenues. Uh, we saw an increase in the MH state funds of about $12,716. In developmental services, we had an increase of $951 in state funding. And in uh, MH regional funds, we had an increase of $455,000 um, that we added to our beginning budget. Uh, clinical supervision, that was again something new that we did not have in our budget before and we're receiving 12,500 plan from uh, Chesapeake CSB and um, we deducted $9,306 for regional suicide prevention that we uh, received usually from Middle Peninsula, but we will not have allocations this year. So. Um, that brought our PC revenues to 64416384 uh, Accordingly, uh, when we looked at our expenditures, uh, we started with our baseline and we removed the infant program, which does not report in the performance contract. We added 1.6 million in contracted manpower and we removed the ACPA program and the child education services, which uh, do not fall in an taxonomy because they're educational. They don't have a taxonomy that they can report under in the performance contract. Uh, we added our indirect administration for a total budget of PC expenditures at 64.416384. So, um, so overall, we're going from a, uh, a budget of 59 million to 64 million Correct. as a change. So that's the, the um, synopsis of the difference in the budget with the new uh, performance contract extension. Thank you, ladies. So now I'm ready for a motion to approve the 2021 performance contract extension. Can I get a motion? Hello? To approve the extension. And then, Mom? Aye. Who's that that made the motion? Pat Allspa. Pat. Carolyn. Okay, thank you. I need a second. I need someone to second the motion to approve the. Uh, Yvonne Lewis, I second. Ah, uh, second. All right. So, Yvonne, second. Um, there are any questions? Call the question. Are you ready to vote? No question? Call the question. Call, call the, the question. Okay, yeah. oh, thank you. <laughs> Hi there, Carolyn. <laughs> We're ready to vote. Um, 
Those in favor of approving the 2021 performance contract extension, um, can we say aye? Aye. 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 So, aye. everyone said aye. Is it unanimous? Any opposed? Yep. There being no opposition, the approved the 2021 performance contract has been approved. Thank you. New business. Now we're going to talk about future education topics next month. Uh, we will have the topic of Project Link. And then October, for October and November, we need some suggestions for topics that you might like to have covered. So please uh, let me know your suggestions so that we will be able to provide those, those sessions. Our next meeting is September 24th. Dr. Harvey, it's Eileen. How are you? Hi, Eileen. How are you? I'm doing good. You in forever. I know, I know. It's nice to see everybody. Um, I would actually suggest that Angie has Dr. Kirtland and Grady Bird come talk about what's going on with our Cerner contract and our Wellagent project uh, within the next couple months so that you can get an update because we are we are going into Kind of the final stages there, and I think it would be important for you all to know what's occurring. Okay, now what was those topics? Well, I heard relevant. It's our current vendor, which is Cerner. That's who we have right now. And then we're moving into the Wellagent product. So basically, you want to update on, provide update on the Yeah, Eileen, that's the, the new program that they're putting in, the tech program that they're putting in place, correct? It's the IT, it's our electronic health record. Yes. The platform for everything underneath this performance contract. Yes. Okay. Okay. We can do that. So that'll take care of one month. So we still need some suggestions for the uh, for this November. Well, this is Yvonne, and I have a, a little concern. Um, I know that we did that legislative um, breakfast a couple of years ago, right. and uh, we 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 discussed the CIT program, um, and that the officers, you know, in Virginia Beach. Have all been trained or received training for the CIT? I think I need some follow up on that. Okay. It's working. Okay. So you'd like an update on CIT and our crisis services? Yes. Okay. You know, the ironic thing about that, this is Eileen again, is um, at the SSAB, which is their next meeting, I'm actually having Cheryl St. John do an update on the first responder team. So if you wanted to, Cindy could send you the link to that meeting and you could listen into that Please. as well. Mm -hmm. When is that? Uh, the that day? is September, first Friday in September. Thank you. September 4th. And so, so you know, that so will send us the link right. for that. Right. Okay. We'll get the link for that, correct? Yes. Okay. We'll get the link for that. Yeah. Yes, we'll get the link for that. Okay. So if you're going to attend the SSAB board to get that information, I'm going to leave November open. Right. But if something changes and maybe, you know, if you're not able to, to attend that presentation, then we can add it back on. That's no problem at all. Okay. Very good. Committee, going to the matters of the chair. I want to make sure that everyone has been, has a selected 
uh, committee to be become a part of the behavioral health committee and the substance developmental services the developmental services committee. So I know that most of us are have selected committees, but if you have not, I encourage you to uh, do so. However, of course, we've not been meeting uh, because of the pandemic, and it looks as if though we may not be meeting uh, in October either. But we will be uh, playing it by ear to see what, what happens with that. There is a committee, however, that needs to be um, activated. That is the nominating committee. We need, a, a, we need a chair for the nominating committee, and then we need a committee to be composed, and the committee should have at least three members of it. And so by September, we need to know who that committee is and who is chair. And in October, the nominating committee has to provide the slate to the board, the slate of um, the ballot for those who will be on the ballot for officers. And then in November, we do the election. We want to make sure we don't uh, miss these dates. So I will be asking someone, or you can volunteer, please, to chair the nominating committee. And then that chair is free to um get other members on that committee or you are free to volunteer for that committee so if anybody wants to you know volunteer right now that's good but if you want to think about it i'll give you a couple weeks and then i'll be um polling you as to who will be willing to serve as chair of the nominating committee and to be on the committee good enough I'm um, Dr. Hodges, this is this is Catrice Washington. I have a question. Uh, what yes. is the responsibility of the uh, nominating committee? Like, what is the what is the, the job? The nominating committee is to is to um, acquire people to um, persons to run for office for okay. president, vice, right? for chair, vice chair, okay. uh, and for secretary. Got it. So to come up with a slate of Slate who will be willing to be elected, be on the slate for election for the following. Thank you. The year begins in November, and so we will be electing officers in November because that's our last month that we meet for this year. Okay. Thank you. So this you'll be holding, holding us and asking which one of us wants want to be chair or vice chair. Secretary, be on the stage for that to serve this. I think, Catrice, you may want to check your handbook too. I think they put those yes. procedures in the handbook. Yeah, I'll, I'll look in there. Just to follow. They are in the handbook, and they are, uh, specifically, you can see them in the bylaws. I did review them. Okay. Um, so just, um, I'm not sure what you Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? So the next thing we need to talk about is, I'm, I'm assuming, but I'm not going to, I'm going to ask, is it your pleasure to continue to meet virtually? Yes, no? Yes. I, I'm okay with it. <laughs> so two people are okay with meeting virtually. I'm three. I'm fine with either. With either? Okay, so you're comfortable now to come to me? Okay. Yes. So are any of you, in, in addition to Susanna, okay with attending in person? I'm Lori, and I'm okay attending in person also. attend in person. That's who. So um Lori, Hosanna, and I heard a third voice. Please email me to let me know your preference so I'll have a better idea 
of the person and how to move from here. Thank, thank you. So now we're going to the matters of the director and the deputy director. We're so happy to have the director with us as know. well as the deputy director today. Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see everybody. Angie, do you want to touch off or would you like me to say a few words first? Uh, however you would uh, like to do it, Eileen. Okay. 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 All right. Well, maybe I'll just add a few things and then you'll probably jump off of a couple items. Okay. Saying. Um, it has been challenging, as everybody is aware, these last few months. That's why it feels like we haven't seen each other in ages. Um, and, and these virtual meetings mean so much to us. And actually, we've been doing a lot of this with the staff. So we've been trying to set up virtual meetings where we have up to 70 staff on a meeting and they can see us ask questions, real free flowing conversation about COVID or teleworking, um, what's going to happen when the schools reopen and they have to manage their families as well as their work. So just a couple items, just so you all are aware, we're trying to be as flexible as possible as an employer. So we're actually encouraging folks to work with their supervisor if they have to alter their schedule, if they have to help with virtual learning for their children. We know this is a very difficult time for them. It was very challenging when the schools went to virtual very quickly last uh, spring and now we're moving into it again. So, you know, all of that does have an effect on our workforce. So our goal is to make sure that nobody feels like they have to quit their job to take care of their family needs. And that has been um, kind of all encompassing, especially in some of the 24 seven programs. You know, Tim is is really going to have to work with people. Maybe they need to do an evening shift as opposed to the day um, and all of that. But we really Oh, my goodness, can't say enough good things about our 24 7 programs and how well they have done through this pandemic. Uh, you have probably heard about some of the state facilities and just how many cases of COVID they've had in the state facilities, employees and clients. And we have just been really, really fortunate. Our staff, um, obviously, in the, what Maria was saying, we had to buy them some scrubs and we've been working on the PPE needs, the protective health uh, equipment, such as, you know, the masks that everybody's wearing. We're wearing them all, all the time in the buildings. Um, you know, I'm demonstrating mask wearing. Um, and for, as uh, leaders, trying to make sure that we model that when we're in and out of the buildings. And so <laughs> in mind, and also with the fact that we have encouraged telework to a very high degree. If you don't have to be in the buildings doing your work, we would like you to be doing it at home. And um, that has helped because with 1500 employees, I'm sure you can imagine that if you bring them all into a tight space, um, you can have some issues. And so we've been really doing a lot of that work to keep people teleworking and also be as flexible as we can. And I think that it's, it's worked out very well. The communication with staff, as I'm stating, has really increased in the last month, month and a half. It took us a little while to get our technology rolling and get everybody familiar with the mute button, um, you know, you can have a lot of feedback when people are unmuted. And so we've had a lot of, you know, training around that, but we're, we're doing very well with having these virtual meetings and giving them information and communicating and hearing their concerns. And clearly people have concerns about working through this time in, in the pandemic. So um, I did want to say that. I also uh, want to acknowledge uh, one thing that Angie said about the budget and also what you were talking about the state budget, we, we are going to have some impacts and we are going to have to come back to you about this because um, with closing for even on the temporary basis, our day programs, that has created a drop in our revenue. And so we'll be talking about that more to you over the next few months. I'm sure Angie and Maria and Dawn um, are all actively looking at that as well as myself and Tim and Jim. So. Um, I did want to say that that is something you'll have to be more and more updated on as we as we go through the next couple years. It's not just going to be this next year. It's going to we're going to feel this for a little while. So we will keep you informed on all of that um, as we can. 
And I would just again like to say, you know, it's nice to see everybody. And do you have any questions for me? Anything that you want to ask before I you know, toss it right back to Angie? Well, I'll uh, review a few things and then they, they might think of additional questions um, during that period. Um, you know, in, in June when we met, things were not um, as, as dire as they are now. Uh, we've all been watching our localities, uh, especially uh, not just the state of Virginia um, as a whole, but Hampton Roads and the increases in cases that we're, we're seeing here. Um, so we have to acknowledge that, that we have um, uh, a high level of COVID still in, in Virginia Beach. Um, and uh, we, we recently noticed some problems with our, our hospital capacity. Uh, when we met in June, that wasn't the case. And I was able to tell you, we had not had any issues locally with finding psychiatric hospital beds. Uh, that situation has changed some. Um, I wouldn't say it's at a horrible level in Virginia Beach yet, but in some localities across the state, it's been a real problem. Um, Eastern State Hospital it was at 115% of capacity this week. And so uh, when individuals go into psychiatric crisis, if there is not a local bed available, they're having to sit in emergency rooms for a while. Um, so we are having issues with medical clearance for people that are either COVID positive or pending uh, test results. Um, also that have complicated medical conditions. All of that can slow down uh, admission to a hospital right now. And um, we're keeping a close eye on that. We're very concerned about it. Uh, we've had a few instances uh, locally uh, that have elevated our attention to this matter. Our city attorney is involved in working with us through this. At the state level, there is attention, and we just talked about it um, in a BAC CSB meeting, um, state executive meetings with the department. And so the, the commissioner agreed to put forward a task force, if you will, to evaluate this issue. Um, so there will be more to come on that. I just wanted you to know that the situation has changed. Um, capacity does go down in some of the facilities if they have COVID cases because they have to reduce the number of beds they can offer um, so because they create quarantine units and, and things like that, which um, uh, has a, a big impact on us. Uh, so we are watching that. We are trying our best to discharge uh, clients when they are ready. Uh, so we have a whole unit that focuses on that, uh, trying to make those discharge plans happen so we can then create uh, new capacity at the state facilities, um, but it is something that um, uh, we're we're concerned about and we're monitoring closely. So I'll keep you updated on that, especially as this new task force comes together. Um, CARES funding update. Um, if you notice, we're not talking about telehealth. Uh, the uh, telehealth FCC grant update this month because unfortunately. Uh, we were not one of the localities in the country um, that received that funding. Uh, so we did get word of that. Um, however, uh, we are looking at other opportunities for CARES funding to purchase um, some mobile equipment. Uh, so the same types of things that we were requesting through the FCC grant, we are requesting through other avenues. Um, so mobile devices for our staff and also the clients. Um, and we'll keep you posted on that. Um, a bit of really good news, and I don't know if Tim uh, wants to talk about this. I don't want to steal his thunder. Um, the ICFs um, had health department inspections looking at COVID uh, health and safety procedures in the ICFs. Tim, do you want to tell the board about that, or would you like for me to? I can drive for a hot second. Um, as you know, the uh, Department of Health inspects all of our ICFs at least once a year. Um, sometimes they're a little bit behind, but you know they do full. You know they're there for a couple of days, look at charts, look at all our incidents. 
Uh, these are a little bit different. Um, these came about, obviously, with the um, onslaught, for lack of a better word, nationwide of uh, nursing homes and the, the, the amount of COVID cases. So they started doing um, uh, virtual um, kind of desk audits where they would call us, let us know certain policies, procedures they wanted to see, and um, and then kind of talk us through like the next day what the thought of uh, you know what we were doing and how we were doing things. These are things about how we're using our PPE, what we're doing to, uh, regarding visitation, what we're doing regarding um, transportation or clients coming and going. Um, you know, and uh, ensuring that our staff are safe. You know, I take I eat temperatures of, of uh, staff on the way in the door. Uh, so, um, you know, with all that, you know, I've mentioned before. Uh, um, Tom Nicholson, you know, he he thrives on this type of uh, safety uh, and emergency procedure stuff. So he had a tremendous plan in place already that he had already made uh, some adjustments to, to some of it regarding you know pandemic type stuff, which we didn't have in there. Uh, so they did all five of them probably within a week and a half um, and, and three different auditors for the five of them. And, uh, you know, all of them, you know, these are a little bit informal audits where they don't give you this big report like they used to with caps and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, there were no citations for bottom line citations for all five uh, houses. So they said we're doing a good job. Of course, they had some suggestions on uh, different things we could do, mostly related to um, if we had somebody who uh, not only was um, uh, positive for COVID uh, uh, staff wise, but even if they'd come into contact with somebody who had and what you know, things we, we should do with the staff. But as uh, you mentioned earlier, we've been luckily very, you know, client wise, no positive cases, um, and everybody's been remaining healthy. So, uh, you know, Tom and his staff have done a great job with that. That's it. Let's thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I just thought that was uh, worth mentioning because it's commendable. Uh, nobody has a handbook uh, for how to handle. COVID, the COVID pandemic. So for you to have a, a review by the uh, Department of Health that has has zero citations is uh, remarkable. So uh, kudos to you and your staff. Um, you echo that. Strategic plan time. So it's at that time where we're updating our 2021-2023 strategic plan. We're doing it a little differently than we had intended thanks to COVID. Um, but we're still doing it and we are seeking active input from our stakeholders. Uh, hopefully, um, all of the board members received the survey to complete. Um, if you did not, please let uh, Cindy Buckler know um, and she will make sure that you receive it. Um, Paul can also help with that, but I, I think Cindy's the one that sent out the stakeholder um, survey. So uh, please take some time. Let us know your thoughts on that. It's also going to go to all the stakeholders that would have attended those summer meetings that Eileen had put together. Um, so we are still seeking feedback from all those individuals. Uh, for BHDS, uh, uh, I sent out a survey for all of our staff. Uh, so the supervisors did an exercise uh, regarding their vision uh, and assessment of gaps. And then we sent out a survey to all of the staff seeking their feedback on the four pillars and uh, what we need to focus on going into the next three years. We are also seeking client input. Um, so they're working on that now. The leaders in uh, the different divisions are working on how to um, get as much client input as we can um, to help us um, develop the new uh, three-year plan. Uh, so we encourage you again to please go on and, uh, and share your input in that survey. The VACSB uh, conference will be virtual in October. Uh, as I mentioned in, in June, they were planning, they knew they wouldn't be able to have an in-person conference in October, so they have created a virtual opportunity. Uh, and that information was sent out to you, I believe, right? Oh, yeah. yes. So Paul sent that out to you. If you would like to register for the virtual conference, just let Paul know and we can make those arrangements. The, uh, the virtual conference will be on October 7th through 8th. Um, so let us know um, of your interest. 
And last but not least, uh, an update on the uh, Behavioral Health Division Director recruitment. We do have uh, several candidates and interviews will be held on August 28th. Uh, Dr. Harvey has graciously agreed um, to be a panelist for that interview, um, so very thankful for her time. Um, Eileen is also uh, recruiting for her Deputy Director of Social Services, and I think those interviews are coming up on the 21st, right Eileen? Yes, we have some virtual interviews, and I will say just for Dr. Harvey's um, info, originally we had asked her to be involved, but now we have two board members from social services who wanted to be involved. So we thought, you know, it was a bit much to ask you to. <laughs> so I hope you're all right with that. Um, and thanks for helping with Angie's recruitment. Uh, just a note about these positions and what occurs in the agency with, with hiring and the hiring freeze. Um, I'm not sure if everyone's been made aware, but we've had a hiring freeze since March. So as soon as the pandemic hit, we were not able to hire positions and we have to put in for a freeze exemption for each position that we want to hire. So we did not put in for these originally because we wanted to focus on direct care positions, the people who were serving the public. And um, it was just recently that we finally put in for a few of the top leadership positions that we were really having some gaps with. One of them is, of course, the deputy for social services in this position. As of right now, you all will probably be surprised, but we have been able to achieve over 110 hiring freeze exemptions. We have a lot of vacancies in the Department of Human Services at any given time. And if we get behind where we're not hiring all the time, we will end up with a massive amount of vacancies. So we have been consistently putting in uh, every week for freeze exemptions. And we have our city is supporting us greatly and have unfrozen 110 of our positions. So that's remarkable. And these two are two of them. So I just, I do wanna acknowledge the fact that the city clearly understands our need and has supported us with trying to continue our hiring process. Any questions? Any other matters who did the order? Uh, Jim uh, has my dashboard, but he only has like two minutes to, to do that. So maybe just to, do you want a high level kind of synopsis or do you want folks to review it on their own? How would you like to do that? Uh, given the time, I think we could probably review them on our own. Okay. Uh, was that an agreement with the rest of the board? <laughs> yes. Yes. Alright, okay. So we will review them on our own and any questions that we have, we will uh, forward them to the committee. Tim's in the pizza cat suit. Did you notice that? Tim, can you talk so it'll put you on the screen? Hi everybody, thanks. <laughs> Hi. Oh. <laughs> oh, I actually was talking to Tim. Because he's got the pizza the cat suit on. Tim, say something. Oh, I see. You see him? Yeah. He, won't, he won't come up on the screen unless he talks. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I saw it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Tim. Yeah. Glad to see you too, but you yeah, don't have is. the costume on. <laughs> Are you disappointed, uh, Jim? Do you want to talk? No, just saying hi was more than enough for me. Thanks. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you all as well. If there are no other matters to give the order, I, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Can I have a motion to adjourn? I'll motion to All right, second. I second. It has been moved and seconded that we adjourn this meeting to we stand adjourned. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you. Good to see everybody. Thank you. Thank that you, way. Dr. Harvey and everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.